about embedded devices like the Raspberry Pi and a little bit about 3D printing. Sound good? Mm. Okay. People are ready. My name's Steven Chen. I'm the Java Community Manager working for Oracle Technology Network. Um, you can reach me on Twitter at Steve on Java, or I also run the Java Twitter handle together with Yolan Poyer, um, and also the Night Hacking Twitter handle. So you can you can tweet to any of those, and it should it should make its way towards me. And um, I work with the Java community. So how many how many of you guys belong to a Java user group? Okay, so everybody. <laughs> so let's see who didn't get a sticker uh, which which Java user group are you a member of yeah so which which um which Java user group do you belong to <laughs> Taiwan Java user group oh okay very good all right sticker Um, who's a Java developer? Are you guys Java developers too? Maybe, maybe. Okay, so for somebody who raised their hands, uh, 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 so maybe the blue shirt. What's what Java technology do you use? I I use um, Java Service mm -hmm. and uh, yes and I used the Sunspot. Oh, the Sunspot! Yes. Oh, I very like cool. It's quite. Yeah. And um, I using also uh, Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I program uh, Java program. Ah, oh, excellent. Okay, that deserves a sticker. Very good. Jaxores and Raspberry Pi, yes. so you're perfect yes, today. Perfect, <laughs> perfect fit. Uh, and there's 150 Java champions throughout the world. Those are developer advocates for Java technologies. Does anybody know the name of a Java champion? Hmm. Ah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they recently, IntelliJ gave Java Champions um, a free license. Um, also, Java user groups. So IntelliJ has free licenses to give out for user groups too. So you should join their free license program to help out your, your friends. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, yeah, sticker. Okay, and there's also about 50 Java user groups who are contributing to the JCP. Does anybody know what the JCP stands for? JC, no, no, not you, you're disqualified. The J Sebastian is a JCP ex expert group member. <laughs> ah, what I what is it, let us know. Yeah, okay, okay, so wait, 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 wait. So you failed because you only got community process. Does anyone, can anyone guess what the J is for? Anyone else? What's the J? Y you th I think you know. Java. Java, very good. <laughs> All right, you get a sticker. <laughs> See, and you got a little bit of, a little bit of help. So we're gonna, that's hard. We're gonna chat about NES today instead, um, which I think is very hard. Who has a um, Famcom? Anybody play the Famcom growing up? Yeah. So in, in Taiwan, did they have Famcom or NES? Famcom in Taiwan, okay. In the US, it's basically the same hardware, but they gave us a gray case, so that was the NES. I think in Europe, Europe, they got the NES as well. Um, but it's basically the same, the s exactly the same hardware. There's about 826 different ROMs to test, um, and they have lots of little hacks and 
tricks to make it work. 3,510 transistors. It was a Motorola 68,000 class CPU. Um, Rico is the one who actually um, developed it, and I think they took out floating points or something to reduce the cost. And to accurately emulate it, you need about 92 million synchronization points between the CPU, the PPU, the pixel processing unit, and the A APU, the audio processing unit. So this is, this is a lot of hard work to test all this stuff. You have to play a lot of, a lot of video games. Anyone recognize this video game? Oh. So I think we, we learned in the last jug, was it Ninja Gokulin? Gok? Ninja something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> this, is, this is a ninja game. Very hard. Um, it's very difficult to beat. How about this one? Rockman, who said that? Oh, oh, oh. You, you know who said that, Sebastian? You pointed. You pointed. It was on the left. Oh, OK. Very good. You already got a sticker. We need somebody who hasn't a sticker yet. OK, this is Rockman. In the, in the US, they called it Mega Man. Um, this, is, this is a lot of fun. But the Rockman 1 is very hard. The later games, easy. <laughs> and um, how, about, how about this one? This is actually a Super Famicom game. Oh, Gradius. Okay, he doesn't have a sticker yet. All right. Okay, so after you play all of these games and you get all this, you know, proper quality testing, you reach Nirvana on video games, which is which is this. Who knows what this is? Okay, yeah, yeah. It I think does it work? No, 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 no. This this is. Street Fighter had like like combinations for moves, but oh yeah, yeah I heard it back there. <laughs> what? Konami yeah, Konami Code. Okay, very good. So I'm going to challenge you because you seem to know about video games. So we're gonna we're gonna have a competition. So um, you you get this to play, and I'm going to use the computer. Pass that back. Oh, and can you fix the camera first for me? Because I'll be over here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a very good gaming console. I highly recommend it. It's called um, NetBeans. It plays lots of games, lots of, lots of good programming games. Um, and we'll both compete to see who can beat the first level in Super Mario faster. Okay, so we need we need somebody to count down and tell I'll us when that. to when to go. You want to do the countdown, Sebastian? Yeah. Three, two, one, go. Ah, ah. All right, that's it. You get you get a head start because I want to be fair, right? I have all this um, gaming skill from all my time. Ah, got to get the mushroom, right? So does anybody know about the? Oh, oh! Oh, he's doing very good, Steve. He's doing good. Fire! He has the fire mark. Oh no! He yeah, he gotta go the fire. Him. I think there was like uh, maybe here. No. Ah. Oh. Was this it? The star. No. I got my revenge though. You know, I think perhaps playing on the keyboard is not the best. Okay. How you doing? We you almost at the flag? Sorry, Steve. You lost. What? We have a winner here. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Give him a round of applause. Very good. Okay. So that's a lot of fun. To play games, um, you can try it out and then pass it to the next one, and everyone can trust you. And everybody, give the the gaming console a try. You mind fixing the camera? So what 
what he was using is a, um, a gaming console that's 3D printed. It's running the same software as I was on desktop, right? So that's running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and it's been optimized for, um, you know, to have good performance on ARM-based processors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the electronics and then a little bit about the software running on it. And then finally, we'll chat about 3D printing. So first, the electronics inside of it. So um, it's using a Raspberry Pi 2. Who, who has a Raspberry Pi? Uh, few, a few folks. Huh. Huh. Do you, you have a Raspberry Pi? No, no, no. Who has, a, who has a Raspberry Pi who doesn't have a sticker? OK, nobody with a Raspberry Pi who hasn't a sticker yet. All right, well, we'll think of something. Oh, you, you actually brought your Raspberry Pi. Oh, wow. That's cool. <laughs> Is it a model Model 2? OK, very good. The, um, the latest model is Model 3, and it has Wi-Fi. But um, I don't have one yet either. <laughs> it just came out this year. Um, so the Raspberry Pi has GPIO headers, which lets you hook up electronics. SD card, which is used for hard drive. Um, HDMI port, a couple USB, and it's powered off of micro USB for power. Does anybody know what these two headers are for on top? So one here and one here. Hmm. So Oh, who said that? Oh, oh. Screen, yes. Okay, that's right. One is used for a display. And yeah, don't power it off. Just leave it running. Uh, second one. Anyone know what it's for? All right, let's let's give a let's give a hint. Hold hold up what's in your hand, Sebastian. Very good, camera. <laughs> Okay, second one's a camera. Um, so the screen, the camera is a little pinpoint camera. The screen is a seven inch touch screen, which is, what's, what's seven inches in centimeters? Like 10 centimeters or something? I'm not quite sure. But um, it's too large to fit inside that case. Um, so to do a portable display, you have a few different options. One is composite. So composites, relatively low quality and if you have to do it on LCD it gets even worse um, HDMI which is much better quality this is what I would recommend if you're hooking up your Raspberry Pi at home it's easy to do um, but you have relatively high power usage to convert back from the um, HDMI signal to an LCD signal um, SPI the serial peripheral interface this is Good for device communication, but it's not really fast enough for a display. You only get 10 to 15 frames per second. And the last one is device tree support. So this is a, a hack which lets you reassign the Motorola pins to different GPIO pin headers. And this is, this is good for this purpose because it is low power usage and it's fast speed and high quality. So it meets all the criteria. Um, and what I used is the Kippa board, which remaps GPIO pins to an LCD header. So it connects to a standard 40-pin LCD header. You pop your device tree file in to remap your pins, and then it uses the 5 volts um, to power the screen, so you don't need a special voltage converter. And optionally, touch support. So that's all good, but there's a problem. Um, it uses... I squared C, UART, and SPI buses are all used and you're only left with six regular GPIO pins left over. Okay, so let's see, who doesn't have a sticker yet? Ba, 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 ba. Okay, so how many, how many buttons are on the controller? Pass it, to the pass it to the row in front of you for a sec. Pass it to the row guys in front. No, no, right, right, right directly in front, yeah, yeah. 
All right. So how many how many buttons are there? Okay, well, that's close, close, but the directional arrow is multiple buttons. So the up, count, count up, down, left, and right, each has separate buttons. Ah, oh, oh, very good, eight, okay, sticker. <laughs> okay, so you have eight total buttons, and we have six GPIO pins. So that's that's a problem, right? So anybody anybody beat the first stage in Mario, first world? I remember the message. So I gave this retro pie to my daughter, and it was her first time playing the original Super Mario. And when she saw this, she's 13, and when she saw this message, she was very upset because modern video games they're supposed to give you like dancing and big applause and secret items and power-ups when you beat a stage not not this right this is this is very um harsh but i think this is the great thing about classic video games it builds it builds character so um that's that's kind of how i felt when i figured out that i only had six gpio pins for eight buttons on the controller does anyone have any ideas on how you can fix that maybe uh a workaround? Yeah? You think the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the D-pad, okay, I see. So you, you can only press one direction at a time. Yeah, so that's good. So actually, I had the same idea. <laughs> but it's, um, it's actually, you can press two at the same time. Because you can hold left and up at the same time. But you can never hold left and right. Or you can never hold up and down at the same time. So what I did is I hooked up left and right to the start button. Okay, so he's actually, he's the first person who guessed this in any of my presentations. Give him a round of applause. That's very good. <laughs> and he gets an extra sticker. Yeah, that's very good. Um, okay, so anyone know why I use diodes in this circuit? Hmm. So I have... This this one goes to the um, left GPIO. This one goes to the right GPIO. And when you press the start button, then it triggers both of them. But why is there a, a diode on this and on this? Anyone know? OK, what, ha what happened if I left the diodes off and I just did a straight wire? So if if you don't the way diodes work is they provide um current protection, right? Current can only flow in one direction. Um so if you press the left button, you can't have current flowing this way, right? Because it gets blocked. And if you press the right button, you can't have current flowing this way because it gets blocked by the other one. But if you press the start button, then the current can flow. Um technically the diodes are reversed because rather than the logic on the GPIO pins, rather than it being um, on is high or 5 volts, the logic is on is off or grounded, 0 volts. So technically it's always on, it's always high. And then when you press the start button, it actually acts as a sink and it, it brings it to ground, it brings it to 0 volts. So th the diodes are the opposite way you would think they, they're facing. But same principle applies. It prevents the, the left button from activating the right and vice versa. If you didn't have the diodes in place, you would trigger left and right on each other. 
Okay, so this is the um, wiring diagram for the project. I did a simple button layout on a breadboard um, to test it out. Um, this is my messy soldering job, hooking up wires together. Um, you really need some heat shrink tubing. I added later to keep the wires separate. Um, and then the completed hardware, and this is a working game console, just without the, the case yet. So let's chat a little bit about the software. So I'm using a Java-based NES emulator called Half NES. It's written by Andrew Hoffman, who goes to University of California, Irvine, I believe. Um, it's a really great implementation. And you can actually run it directly on the Raspberry Pi. Um, this is NetBeans for remote debugging. But the problem is that you only get six frames per second on the Raspberry Pi. So normally you need 60 frames per second. With the default implementation, it's too slow. You only get six frames per second. So that's not very good. Ah, uh, so. Which game is that from? Anyone know? Who doesn't have a sticker yet? Ah, uh, you don't, you didn't get a sticker yet. So, can you guess which game the the game over screen is from? And I'll give you a hint. It's actually the same game running there. OK, well, well, we'll find another question. Um, this is the game over screen from Super Mario Brothers. Is it still working, the NES? No, no? Freeze. All right, pa pass it up. You mind grabbing it, Sebastian? Um, so if you want to switch games or you want to, if it freezes or something funky happens, press, oh, just somebody press start. Yeah, yeah, it was paused. OK, so it's working again. Um, if you want to switch games, press start and select at the same time. And there's a menu screen. And you can switch games or restart it or do different things on it. Um, just don't power it off from the menu. Let Leave it running. OK, so I use the emulator, uh, the NetBeans emulator, to, um, to do some performance profiling. And I came up with a bunch of different things. Some of these helped with performance, and some of them didn't. Um, so one thing I changed is I switched from using Swing video um, to using JavaFX. Who, who's used JavaFX here? Huh, huh. Anybody? OK, so I think next time I come. We should do a JavaFX session. <laughs> <laughs> but um, JavaFX is a desktop UI toolkit. Um, very, very good performance. And it, it has direct 3D acceleration. And it also uses direct frame buffer support. Um, so it's easily like four or five times faster than using Swing Video. Um, synchronization between the CPU, the PPU, and the APU. So it was one per pixel, and I changed it per line. Um, so that helped with performance, but it's slightly less accurate. Um, it breaks like the Code Masters games in the UK. Certain games don't work because they rely on per pixel timings for synchronization. I replaced some bitwise helper functions. There are a bunch of helper functions where you'd pass in a long and a position of the bit, and it would tell you if the bit was set or it let you clear the bit. Um, I replace those with bit masks. So if you use a um, bit and operation, actually you were you were presenting about um, Boolean operators in your presentation. I saw that. So you guys should be experts on how bit masks work after your presentation. So let, let's let's think of a good question for this. Oh, blah 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 blah. Okay. So so for the book later. We'll ask a bit mask question and see if you guys can get it right. <laughs> so you should study on your bit operations now. Uh, I also replaced the 
audio processing unit used double math. I replaced it with some long math instead, which is much faster on the Raspberry Pi. Array access was happening, um, and I replaced it with unsafe. Who knows? Does anyone know what unsafe is? So unsafe, there's a set of APIs in an unsafe, I think it's a class, that you're not supposed to use. It's unsupported. And it might go away in a future version of Java, but it lets you get outside of the memory model and do some things you're not supposed to do. So I tried to use it to get around array balance checks, but it turns out it, it doesn't actually help with performance. Um, I tested it both ways quite a lot, and the performance is the same. Um, so apparently the just-in-time compiler is smarter than I am. And I wouldn't recommend in general using unsafe because it's likely to go away and make your program not upgrade to a newer version of Java. I replaced some loops with system array copy, and this also doesn't help because there's an intrinsic, which does this automatically. And I also changed the audio to flush. Rather than flushing once per frame, it flushes once per three to four frames. So um, this makes it faster because the buffer flushes for the audio on the Raspberry Pi are very slow. But it makes the audio slightly laggy. So um, the audio, like, it's fine for music, but the sound effects are slightly delayed, like a 15th of a second. Um, it's not noticeable, like you were probably playing the game and didn't notice it, but it is, um, if you make the delay too long, it's actually noticeable. Okay, and now 3D printing. Does anyone have a 3D printer? Uh, see, now you're laughing, but two nights ago in Toyama, one of the guys had a Flash Forge 3D printer. Okayama. Oh, yeah, Okayama. 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 Okay. Yeah, we're not going to Toyama because they canceled on us. <laughs> okay. So in Okayama, one of the guys had a Flash Forge 3D printer. And um, it's, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, and it's... It's a pretty good printer, so that's one that you can probably find that's more affordable. And I think that guy has lots of new friends now. <laughs> he probably has lots of people who want to be his friend and come to his house to print things. So if you want to have more friends, if you're the only person in the user group who has a 3D printer, I think, I think you'll have more friends, right? Maybe. Yes, yes. Will, will, you, will you come over and print things at their house? No, no. no. Okay, so my, my 3D printer is an Ultimaker. Um, this is made in the Netherlands, and the way 3D printers work is you get a spool of plastic. In this case, it's PLA, which is a corn-based um, plastic, and you feed it through a Bowden tube, and then it gets heated to about 210 degrees Celsius, and then it um, draws little um, shapes. Um, layer by layer, it builds up the shape, and it can do very precise structures. So it's quite good at, at um, creating things. This is the software I used to design the case um, called Fusion 360 from Autodesk. They have a free student license, and they also have a free hobbyist or startup license. Um, so it's expensive software, and it actually works really great. Um, but you can get a free license if you're using it for hobby projects. And the nice thing about it is you specify the dimensions um, for the buttons and the cutouts, and then you extrude it, so you do 3D operations like chamfers and um, rounded edges and um, extrusions. And later on, you can go back and you can modify the original model to have it automatically update and make changes to it. This is what the inside of the case looks like. It prints in a few different parts, and then you put the parts together to make your shape. Um, one of the challenging things was building a hinge in plastic. This was very difficult. Um, my original design, I created a 20-sided polyhedron with sharp edges. And then it would it would lock the hinge would lock at you know different points, but the problem was I gave it to my daughter to play with, and then she she opened and closed it a lot. 
maybe 50 times. And then um, the hinge was perfectly round, perfectly smooth. So it stopped working. So um, that didn't work too well. Uh, anyone know this game? This was um, Zelda 2, Adventure of Link. Maybe that this probably came out in. Uh, sometimes with the US games and the Japanese games, they, they release the same games, but they number them differently too. I know for um, Square does that a lot for the Final Fantasy series. The Japanese numbers and the US numbers don't match because they actually skipped games for the US, which is mean. OK, so anyway, um, the design. I used, let's see, who doesn't have a sticker? Ah, ah, ah. Okay, you don't have a sticker yet. So what, what, what shape did I use for the hinge? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what, what's the shape that I used to design the hinge? Triangle. Very good. All right, sticker. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually uses two triangles that are circumscribed, so they have the same center. But one triangle is slightly larger than the other. So there's a very tiny difference between the two triangles. And what it creates is rather than being a circle now, you have a slightly oblong triangle. Right? And so if you have a slightly oblong triangle like this and you rotate it, how many, how many positions is it going to stop in and, and be happy? So you didn't get a sticker yet, right? Oh. So how many, how many positions can the triangle rotate it in and then stop? Yes, very good. Sticker. Three. San. 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 Okay. We, we have to practice Japanese later. So you can help me with my... Okay. So um, you can... It, it's happy in three positions. Unfortunately, um, one of those positions doesn't work because the hinge, the hinge can't open that far. So only two of the positions work. So it, it's, it's happy when it's closed and all the way open. And then when you're 60 degrees off like that, that's the, um, the most resistance. And um, Fusion 360 actually has an interference mode where you can calculate the exact amount of interference. Um, so I set up the hinge to be 60 degrees off and then calculated it. And it's 28.254 cubic millimeters of overlapping material. Um, and you can actually modify this in the program. Like you can adjust the, um, nope. you can adjust this number and then change the tolerance. And then that will actually update the amount of overlapping material. So I printed a bunch of different ones and tested it. And this was about right for the, the right friction. So it has a little bit of resistance without actually breaking. If you, if you make it too, if you make the shape too tight, then when you rotate the hinge, it'll actually break the, it'll break the, um, the hinge mechanism. Um, and the reason this works better than a um, polyhedron is because when you're rotating a shape like this, the plastic has to bend slightly to make room for it. And the plastic will bend back to the same shape. So you can open and close it many times. 
Um, the, you can try with the green one going around, but it still has a good amount of resistance, even though it's been opened, you know, probably thousands of times now. It's It's been used quite a bit, and it still retains a little bit of the um, friction. Okay, this is the... Um, um, software for slicing, which takes the 3D model and turns it into instructions for the printer. I'm using Cura, which is an open source software made by the Ultimaker guys. This is an actual print, showing an example of it printing on the printer. Um, here's some of the other parts, the top screen and the pins on the side. Here is all of the parts. So, who doesn't have a sticker? Oh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay, how many how many parts are there total? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ju he said Jui? Juni. Oh, that's not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I heard. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, very good. Sticker. So there's 11, 11 parts total. Um, on, the, on the case that's going around, where's, where's the case now? Okay, so open it up and um, feel the D-pad. See the D-pad, the left, right, up, down controller? Yeah, so f feel the texture of that and compare it to the, the case texture. Touch the case now. So you see how the case is rough? Just when you touch it, when you touch the case with your finger, see it's rough, the surface? Yeah, 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 yeah. See that's rough? And, and touch the D-pad, the, the directional arrow. That's smooth, right? So actually, I printed those on different printers. I cheated. <laughs> so um, originally, I printed it like this, and it would be the same color if I printed it on the Ultimaker. Um, but it was a little bit too rough, and it hurts your thumb after a while from using it. So for this part, instead, I printed it on a stereolithographic printer. Anyone know, or anyone seen a stereolithographic printer? No? Um, the way stereolithography works is um, you, rather than using hard plastic, you use liquid plastic. Um, so you have a liquid resin, and then you use a laser, and the laser produces ultraviolet light, which cures the resin and turns it into a hard substance. And so, like the, the normal... 3D printer, you print and you you print from the bottom layer and you print up. With a stereolithographic printer, you have a pool of liquid and the build plate goes into the pool and it draws and it comes goes up a layer. It draws and it goes up and at the very top it's um, upside down. Actually, I was I was just right right before this I was doing Java one photos. And I think I think I think this is interesting, but I have to Oh, there's a drone. There's somebody with a lot of things. So somewhere there is there's a stereolithographic printer here. Oh, that's the um devices at the hub. This is before it got broken. <laughs> it was it was Hall at one point. Anyone seen Pepper? This is actually a Japanese robot. Pepper? Oh, yes. So we had um, the Aldebaran guys, or the SoftBank guys, came to Java 1 and brought... Uh, uh, that was it. Okay. So this this is a um, stereolithographic printer. So it the tray goes into the pool of liquid, and then it, it draws using a laser, and it draws upside down. So this is the first layer, and it draws one layer at a time. And it's it's pretty cool. At the at the end of it, um, where's another photo? 
No, that's not another photo of it. At the end of it, you actually this is this is the printer too. Yeah, so this is this is the Ultimaker and this is the Form Labs. It has a orange case and the orange material blocks the ultraviolet light. Oh, there was Duke. So the same the same Duke model, if you go to Java Day Tokyo, that's the one which we normally ship to Java Day Tokyo. Uh, here, here's the one I wanted. Um, so here you can see it fully out of the water. And this is a, um, a special ge geometrical structure, which is impossible to print on a, on a standard 3D printer. But you can print it, a very intricate structure like this, on the um, stereolithographic printers. And the finishing process for this is you, you take it off, you cut all the supports, and then you put it in um, alcohol. Um, and you, you kind of use the alcohol to remove the remaining material. Um, and then you let it dry a little bit. And then it, it ends up with very fine detail and a smooth surface. So for the directional arrow of the um, gaming case, this is the, the perfect sort of um, substance for using it. So that's that D-pad on the case is an example of something printed on a stereolithographic printer. OK, here's the buttons that fit inside the case. I kind of bend out the pins a little bit to make room for it, um, and then solder on it. Um, inside the case, you stick the Raspberry Pi on the left and the battery on the right. The battery is designed to last for um, six and a half hours. It's a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, and that was my daughter's requirement. The, the RetroPie has to last for one long car ride. So um, this is a satisfied kid customer. She can use it on, on long car rides. Um, in the back here is the power boost, which gives you the LCD lights and the charge circuitry for charging the Raspberry Pi. Here's the Kippa board and the, um, and the cable. These are the plastic inserts, which hold the buttons in place. The remaining buttons, the um, speaker and the amplifier board. Um, here is the um, ribbon cable, which then goes up into a um, extension and then into the touch screen. And then on the side here, you have two pins. And the pins, these are the pins with the um, kind of oblong triangle design. And on the top are locking pins. So once you stick them in, you stick a locking pin in place to hold it in place. And one of the design principles of the, the entire thing was to make sure that it was something that um, anybody could 3D print. Um, without any screws or any extra hardware. So other than the electronics, all you need is a 3D printer to design this. And then you just print it and you snap together the parts and everything slides together and fits without any screws. And you'll notice on the case, there's no screw holes or anything holding it together. It's just designed so the, the way it fits together, it will stay in place. Um, you get to remove a little bit of material here and here. And then you have a um, slide on the top and then you have a working game console. So easy, right? You guys can build one. <laughs> okay, so I have one more um, video for you guys, gaming video. Any of you play this game? Metroid? Ah, oh, so you, you look like you played it. Did you beat it? No? Okay, so if you if you beat it and you get all of the items, you collect like everything, I think. Then you you find out that your um your character is actually well your character is in a spacesuit, so you don't know the gender. So your character is actually a female. Um, so it's it's slightly cheating, but actually this is one of the earliest games with the female main character. <laughs> in the in the modern versions, um, like Super Smash Brothers, they let you pick. You can either play the Samus with, with the suit or without the suit. Um, so I think this is a, a good example for having more, we should have more females in our industry in general. Um, so this is my daughter playing the RetroPie. She's, she's a young coder. She helps me with my kids' workshops. And when we do kids' workshops, we have about 
50-50, sometimes 60-40 ratio of girls to boys. Um, and I think somewhere along the way, like like elementary school, it's very good, and middle school, it's very good, and high school, somewhere higher up, more 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 guys get steered into technology careers, and more women drop out. Um, so if you have if you have kids, you know, encourage them to to be technologists, do cool, write cool stuff, build cool things. I think doing projects like this too, like things with your hands, um, are also a good way to encourage people into technology because it's more hands-on. It's easier to easier to work with. Um, so this project is one of several projects in the book, Raspberry Pi with Java, which we have two copies to give away. Um, and also there's a like a line follower and a coffee demo and a, a hat. So to, to get the book, you have to ans answer a question from myself or from Sebastian correctly. Okay, so why don't you, why don't you go first, you, uh, your question? Okay, my question, of course, is related to my presentation, so I hope you m remember it an hour ago. Um, you remembered I used some JuxRS functionality to create your rice, which uh, used some functionality you coded in your project. And specifically, I used one class to create your rice. Can you tell me the name of that class, the JuxRS class? It is on maybe can you translate? Yeah, repeat okay. the question. Okay. Um in my talk I used some JuxRS functionality to create URIs programmatically with information out of your JuxRS project. And specifically, I used one class to create your rise. I injected the class in my JuxRS resource, and I used it to create the your rise. Can you tell me the name of that JuxRS component? Yes. Your rise info. Yeah, very correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Round of applause. Round of applause, please, to get a copy of your book. Okay, and um, I, I promised you guys a logic, uh, a bit a bit logic question. So, let's see. I have to I have to think of the answer before I ask it, don't I? Um. So if you have, if you have a a long, and you have a a bit mask. Anyone know what a bit mask is? Bit masks are typically like, like you have like zero 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 one, zero 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 zero. So exactly, you know, one bit is set in the entire number. Um, and to have different bit masks, like for the first position or the second position, you have like one bit mask is one zero 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 zero. A bit mask for the second bit would be zero one zero 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 zero. Okay, so you have a bit mask, and you have a a long. So what Boolean operator, they're, they're Boolean operators, right? No, uh, bit, bin bit, bit, what? Yeah, bit, bit operator, is that what they're called? I don't know. Anyway, what, <laughs> what, what bit operator do you need to clear a bit? Yeah, okay, go for it. Exclusive or. Exclusive or. Okay, so I, I think that's the right answer, but let me think. So how does how does exclusive or work? Uh, uh. Yeah, yeah, so for if it's if it's if it's Yeah, yeah, but I think, is it is it XOR or is it like you have to do a not and then an XOR? I think you need a not in there too, right? 
can't remember. Which are you using? For, for clearing. For clearing for, for one variable. So if you do, he's correct if you do one variable x or the same variable. So x or the same variable. Clearing each other. They clear each other. So if it's if it's one one, yeah. XOR would be zero. So zero and zero zero also clear. Zero zeros. Oh yeah. Okay. So that's right. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Very good. So book. Round of applause. Round of applause. <laughs> okay. So we've 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 proven that um, one of our attendees is smarter than the presenter. <laughs> So very good. You you were the first person to get the um, question right about the um, um, what you call it the hack for getting the multiple buttons the six GPIO pins to eight. And you also were faster at bit bit logic than me. So very good. And what what else have we learned? Oh yeah, we learned that there's a Belgian beer festival too. Oh. So apparently apparently Fukuoka is um, Fuku people in Fukuoka like Belgian beer. <laughs> so, uh, this week, uh, uh, there is there is a beer weekend that is on uh, mm -hmm. October twenty fifth. Mm. Uh, so, okay, we just have to <laughs> we just arrived at the right time. Yeah, yeah, we arrived at the right time. Okay, so thank you guys very much for coming to the seminar today. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and if you'd like to to join us for our after activities you're welcome to come along so thank you very much thank you very much